early college years. So a few years back, as one of uh, our one of our assignments. So our job was basically to read the book and write a. I want to say it was a five page. Could be wrong, but I believe it was. It might have been even like seven to ten pages, if I'm not mistaken. It was. It was maybe around five. I might be lying, <laughs> but um, it was basically every week. Um, we had a new book, and one of the weeks we actually got this book as one of our assignments, and I really enjoyed the book. Really enjoyed the story to it. So, snow falling on cedars. There's a backside, um, basically a little like synopsis, I guess you could say, for um, the story. Got myself some chamomile tea. Not sure where you are watching from, but I live in California, and where I reside, where I live currently, I it's been getting definitely um, colder. These last few days have been a lot colder than um, before. Definitely starting to feel that winter weather coming in which I actually don't mind at all I prefer um, winter I prefer cold a lot more than being hot like for sure no question so let me read the back side real quick San Pedro Island, north of Puget Sound, is a place so isolated that no one who lives there can afford to make enemies. But in 1954, a local fisherman is found suspiciously drowned, and a Japanese-American named Kabu Miyamoto is charged with his murder. In the course of the ensuing trial, it becomes clear that what is at stake is more than one man's guilt. For San Pedro, memory grows as sticky as cedar trees and the fields of ripe strawberries. Memories of a charmed love affair between a white boy and that Japanese girl who grew up to become the couple's wife. Memories of land desired, paid for, and lost. Above all, San Pedro is haunted by the memory of what happened to its Japanese residents during World War II. When an entire community was sent into exile while its neighbors watched, gripping, tragic, and densely atmospheric, snow falling on cedars is a masterpiece of suspense, but one that leaves us shaken and changed. So there you go. I might just, um, Excuse the background noises. Probably hear cars, loud cars uh, in the background. So, David Gutterson is the author. chapter in this video and then I'll make a like I said I'll make multiple videos of of this book reading um, until I complete it pretty much so starting off with chapter one the accused man Kabu Miyamoto sat proudly upright with 
with a rigid grace, his palms placed softly on the defendant's table. The posture of a man who has detached himself insofar as is possible at his own trial. Some in the gallery would later say that his stillness suggested a disclaim for the proceedings. Others felt certain it fueled a fear of the verdict that was to come. Whichever it was, Gabo showed nothing, not even a flicker of the eyes. He was dressed in a white shirt, worn buttoned to the throat in gray, neatly dressed trousers. His figure, especially the neck and the shoulders, communicated the impression of irrefutable physical strength and of precise, even imperial bearing. Sorry. I was just checking something. Got a notification on my phone. Kabul's features were smooth and angular. As his hair had been cropped close to his skill, skull in a manner that made its musculature prominent. Musculature. And the face of the charge that had been leveled against him, he sat with his dark eyes strained straight ahead and did not appear moved at all. In the public gallery, every seat had been taken. Yet the courtroom suggested nothing of the carnival atmosphere, sometimes found at country murder trials. In fact, the 85 citizens gathered there seemed strangely subdued and contempl contemplative. Most of them had known Carl Hain, a salmon killer with a wife and three children who was buried now in the Lutheran Cemetery up on Indian Rome Hill. Most had dressed with the same communal property they felt on Sundays before attending church services. And since the courtroom, however, stark, bared in their hearts the dignity of their prayer houses, they conducted themselves with the church-going solemnity. This courtroom, Judge Lowen, Buildings down at the end of a damp, drafty hallway on the third floor of the Island County Courthouse was run down and small as courtrooms go. It was a place of gray hued and bleak simplicity, a cramped gallery, a bench for the judge, a witness stand, a plywood platform for the jurors and scuffed tables for the defendant and his prosecutor. The jurors sat with studiously impassive faces as they strained to make sense of matters. The men, two truck farmers, a retired grammar, a bookkeeper, a carpenter, a boat builder, a grocer, and a halibut schooner deckhand were all dressed in coats and neckties. The women all wore Sunday dresses. A retired waitress, a sawmill secretary, two nervous fisherwives, a hairdresser accompanied them as alternates. The bailiff Ed's names or Soames, at the request of Judge Fielding, had given a good head of steam to the sluggish radiators, which now and again sighed in the four corners of the room. In the heat, they produced a humid, overbearing swelter. The smell of sour milk, mildew seemed to rise from everything. Snow fell that morning outside the courtroom, courthouse windows, four tall narrow arches of leaded glass at a glass that yielded a great quantity of weak December lights. A wind from the sea lofted snowflakes against the window panes where they melted and ran toward the casements. Beyond the courthouse, the town of Amity Harbor spread along the island, sh the island shoreline. A few window when dipped, decrepit Victorian mansions 
Remnants of a lost era of Seacoin optimism loom now out of the snowfall on the town's sporadic hills. Beyond them, cedars wove a steep mat of steel green. The snow blurred from the vision, the clean contours of these cedar hills. The sea wind drove snowflakes steely inland, rolling them against the fragrant trees, and the snow began to settle on the highest branches with a gentle implacability. The accused man, with one segment of his consciousness, watched the falling snow outside the windows. He had been exiled in the county jail for 77 days, the last part of September, all of October, and all of November. The first week of December in jail, there was no window anywhere in his basement cell, no portal, though, which the autumn light could come to him. He had missed autumn, he realized now, it had passed already, evaporated. The snowfall which he witnessed out of the corners of his eyes, the various wind-whipped flakes against the windows, struck him as infinitely beautiful. San Pedro was an island of five thousand damp souls, named by lost ballards, who moored offshore in the year 1603. They'd sailed in search for the Norwest Passage, as many Spaniards did in those days, and their pilot and captain, Martin de Aguilar of the Viscano expedition, sent a work detail ashore to call a fresh bar from among the hemlocks at water's edge. Its members were murdered almost immediately upon settling foot on the beach by a bar of Nolka safe leaders. Settlers arrived, mostly wayward souls, and in centuries who had meandered off the Oregon Trail. A few ruling pigs went slaughtered in 1845 by Canadian Englishmen up in, up in arms about the border. But St. Pedro Island generally lay clear of violence after that. The most dis distressing news story of the preceding 10 years had been the wounding of an island resident by a drunken Seattle yacht man with a shotgun on the 4th of July 1951. Amity Arbor, the island's only town, provided deep moorage for a fleet of bird singers and one man culminating boats. It was an uns Centric rainy when you beating sea village down rotten and milled it milled with the boards of its buildings bleached and weathered their drain pipes rusted a dull orange. Its long steep inclines lay around the desolate. Its high curved gutters swarmed most winter nights with traveling rain. Often the sea wind made most winter nights with when was it, made a single traffic light flail from side to side or cause the town's electric power to flicker out and say to stay out for days main street presented to the populace pearson's grocery a post office fisk's hardware center larson's pharmacy a dime store with fountain owned by a woman in seattle a budget power office a chandlery lorry ops apparel shop Close our men's real estate agency, the St. Pedro Cafe, the Media Harbor Restaurant, and a battered, rundown filling, filling station owned and operated by the Tor Carson Brothers at the wharf, a fish packing plant, exceeded odor of some on bones, and the grill sided pilings of the State Fair Terminal Lane among a fleet of Mildred boats rain the spirit of the place patiently beat down everything man made on winter evenings it roared in sheets against the pavements and made Emory Harbor invincible invisible and San Pedro had to a brand of virgin beauty that inclined its residents toward the poetical enormous hills soft green with cedars rose and fell in every direction the island homes were damp in most and moss covered with lane solitary fields and the veils of alfalfa fed corn and strawberries 
Half the sorts cedar fences lined the gallows roads which laid beneath the shadows of the trees and past the brightened meadows. Cows grazed, stinking of sweet dung and addled by summer black flies. Here and there, an islander dried his hand at milling saw logs on his own, leaving fragrant heaps of sawdust and mounds of cedar bark at roadside. The beaches glistened with smooth stones and sea foam, two dozen coves, and islands each with its pleasant models, sailboats, and summer homes, ran the circumference of San Pedro, an endless series of pristine anchorages. Inside Amity Harbor's courthouse, opposite the courtroom's four tall windows, a table had been set up to accommodate the influx of newspaper men to the island, the out of town reporters, one each from Bellingham and Cortez and Victoria, and three from the Seattle, Seattle papers, exhibited no trace of the solemnity evident among the respectful citizens in the gallery. They slumped in their chairs, rested their chins in their hands, and whispered together conspiratorially with their backs only a foot from a steam radiator the out of town reporters were sweating. Ishmael Chambers, the local reporter, found that he was sweating too. He was a man of 31 with a hardened face, a tall man with eyes of a war veteran. He had only one arm. The laugh the left having been amputated ten inches below the shoulder joint, so that he wore the sleeve of his coat pinned up with the cuff fastened to the elbow. Ishmael understood that an air of disdain, of contempt for the island and its inhabitants, blew from the knot out of town reporters toward the citizens in the gallery. Their discourse went forward in a miasma of sweat, and the heat had suggested a kind of indolence. Three of them had loosened their ties just slightly. Two others had removed their jackets. They were reporters, professionally jaded and professionally immune, a little too well traveled in the last analysis to exert themselves toward the formalities San Pedro demanded. Suddenly, of mainlanders, Ishmael, a native, did not want to be like them. The accused man, Gabo, was, was somebody he knew, somebody he'd gone to high school with, and he couldn't bring himself like the other reporters to remove his coat of Gobo's murder trial. At ten minutes before nine that morning, Ishmael had spoken with the accused man's wife on the second floor of the Island County Courthouse. She was seated on a hall bench with her back to an arched window just outside the assessor's office, which was closed, gathering herself apparently. Are you all right? He said to her. But she responded by turning away from him. Please, he said. Please, Hatsu. She turned her eyes on then, on his then. Ishmael would find later, long after the trial, that their darkness would belogger his memory of these days. He would remember how rigorously her hair had been woven into a black knot against the nape of her neck. She had not been exactly cold to him, not exactly hateful, but he'd felt her distance anyway. Go away, she said in a whisper, and then for a moment she'd glided. She declared he remained uncertain afterward that her eyes had meant punishment, sorrow, pain. Go away, repeated Hatsu Miyamoto. Then she turned her eyes once again from his don't be like this, said Ishmael. Go away, she'd answered. Hatsu said, Ishmael, don't be like this. Go away, she'd said again. Now in the courtroom with sweat on his temples, Ishmael felt embarrassed to be sitting among the reporters and decided that after the morning's recess, he would find a more anonymous seat in the gallery. In the meantime, he sat facing the wind-driven snowfall, which had already begun to mute the streets outside the corral's windows. He hoped it would snow recklessly and bring to the island the impossible winter purity, so rare and precious, he remembered fondly from his youth. Alright, so this is it for this video. Um, I hope you enjoyed me reading the first chapter of 
snowfall and cedars. Like always, please make sure to leave a like if you enjoyed the video. Subscribe. Um, and yeah, let me know if you've read this book or if you're enjoying it this far. Alright. Um, thank you guys so much. Hope you guys take care and I will see you on the next one.